It's great to be here again. Um, I feel really grateful uh, to be able to come and speak, um, to share what I believe God has put on my heart. Um, and it's been a good weekend. I said I wouldn't mention that Forest beat Liverpool yesterday. <laughs> so I... So I won't mention that Forest beat Liverpool yesterday, because if I did mention that Forest beat Liverpool yesterday, I'd be doing exactly what I said I wouldn't do. So um, I won't do that. But um, despite that, as a Forest fan, I live in a world of uncertainty, um, where I don't really know what's going to happen in that next hour and a half. But equally, we've spoken this morning and prayed about um, people who live in a world of uncertainty. And that could even be um, children going off to university. It could be work. It could be the fact that we don't know whether we're going to get to the other side of the English Channel or not. And actually, I believe what God is saying is the only thing we can be certain on is him. And uh, I'm in a Baptist church, so I better speak some Spurgeon, haven't I? Um, so Spurgeon, 19th century preacher, went to school about the same time as Barry, and um, he spoke a great word that I think has challenged me over the last few days um, as I've been reading around his word, and he's put, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. And what he means by that is, He's learned to embrace the fact that actually all these things that come to challenge us, they push us closer to God if we seek him. And I want us to get to that position, especially as we're coming to communion, that actually this is an opportunity for a new start. But it does require work. Our life in Christ requires work. And God expects us to work hard. This has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, by the way, but I will make it quick, so... Um, Colossians 3 um, talks about the fact that we need to work hard with a heart for the Lord, not for masters. And again, Spurgeon says, the best and wisest thing in the world is to work as if it all depended on you, but then trust God, knowing that it depends on him. So just bear that in mind as we go through um, these next few minutes, just looking at this thing of a new start, the answer being the rock of ages. I've been challenged over the last few, I guess, weeks to months by um, the scripture that is probably one of the least that you would tend to go to if you're looking for that encouragement, um, Revelation. Um, but about a year or so ago, I was part of preaching a series on Revelation, and it was a challenge to me because I needed to really understand the detail and the foundation of Revelation in order to be able to speak it out. Um, and if we just look at Revelation, I don't know if we've got the slide up, you might not be able to see that as well. I never quite know which font to use or colors to use, but we'll give this one a go. Um, Revelation 1. To him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, has made us to be a kingdom and priests, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Goes on to verse 8, and we've mentioned this this morning. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And then this is um, the bit that always gets me, I think, when I think about the context of how this was, when um, this is about that revealing of Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. And it got me thinking about the fact that so often we look at life and um, I guess the perils that will come to challenge us. And the other bit is the fact that this is God talking through Jesus about a new creation and the promise that we have. 
You may have seen sort of the um, advert that goes on stickers on the back of Land Rovers sometimes. No disrespect to Land Rovers, but it says, One life, live it. It's the mantra for thrill seekers. Now, I don't jump out of planes. I, in fact, I don't do anything that's really um, thrill seeking like that. I'm scared of heights. I barely go skiing, but I have to close my eyes on a lift. Um, but thrill seekers all over the world will run by that mantra one life, live it. Live it to the excess. Live it to the, to the point where you're not sure what's going to happen next. Live it to the fact that actually try as many things as you can. But whilst experience, learning and growing are important for us to thrive, I want to suggest a different perspective and probably an even greater adventure. Not necessarily one life, live it, but one way, believe it. Jesus, John 14, 16, 6, sorry, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The amplified version, as you would expect, said, Jesus said to him, that's Thomas, I am the only way. I am the real truth, and I am the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I don't think scripture is trying to promote, therefore, trying as many things as possible or living a life only at extremes. But it's about recognizing that we are designed by our creator, that we are chosen, we are loved, and yes, we have value. And we've been given a gift of life on earth, but it has a purpose, a purpose beyond society's ideas of extreme adventure. You see, God's adventure and plan for us is to take a step outside of our comfort zone in getting to know him, the realization that he's the answer. Yes, he's the beginning and the end. And you know what? He's everything in between. It's about receiving his love and then loving him and making sure then that we tell everyone about it. I was listening to a, um, a preacher online last week and he said his, uh, one of his great disappointments will be if he is metaphorically walking through the gates of heaven and he hears a voice behind and it's someone that he encountered, a friend perhaps from years ago, who said, when I asked you that question, why didn't you speak to me about God? It's a challenge probably for us all there, isn't it, that... Actually, do we, do we make the most of opportunities? Um, perhaps I should be embarrassed to say that I don't. But we have one life, live it, but we have one way, believe it. We don't need to look far to see that our human worldly experience can lie so often in a an environment where we feel void of purpose, where we lack direction, where we can be weighed down by lies, we can be steeped down with the baggage of sin, where things of our past and our present, dare I say, hold us back, where people around us or the world will tell us that we aren't worthy, that we're not good enough where purpose is about the here and now. Perhaps it's about our identity and our value. Perhaps it's defined by our position, our status at work. <coughs> where worldly opinion is that the focus should be about popularity, how many likes I've got on Facebook, or if that's what it is. I'm not quite sure. I don't really do Facebook much. But, but it's difficult, isn't it? because we live in that juxtaposition between what the world and society pressures us to believe, that one life living to extreme adventure, and yet what Christ is saying is that our purpose isn't how many likes we get, but it's how we can best glorify him. God in all his love wants us to see his purpose for us, the truth that he is the one and only way the fact he's the answer and we've got an opportunity to experience him 
as Steve prayed, in a restored way, a resurrected life in him. Nothing is impossible for our God. Whatever has gone before is important for our experience, but it's a way that we can turn back and seek the Lord. And in him we have newness of life. But it's a matter of the heart. It's an internal change that doesn't focus on materialism. It doesn't focus on that outward appearance. The superficial aspects we call the flesh. But the manifestation of that change is what others will then see. Through the way that we live that renewed life in and for him. So God has set us free through Jesus' death on the cross and I think importantly in the bit that we so often forget which is why it's apt that we are looking at communion is through yes his death but his resurrection that's what gives us hope and life eternal through there and in our desire to know him and and acknowledging him as Lord we've been given that rite of passage of life where dare I say those chains have gone the chains that can often bind us and prevent us from thriving, that restrain us from moving beyond our natural boundary. We have new freedom in Christ. Sin, whatever that is, is defeated. And they're not just words, that's the truth. That's what it says in his word. And in him, sin is defeated. So whatever trials we've experienced or wrongs that we've done, we're no longer captive. We have been given freedom in him. And I hope what that does is that we can then see and experience that overwhelming joy. And dare I say that peace that is in Christ. We get to live with a new purpose. And yes, that bit is about us, but actually it is all about him. Because the expectation of that is that then we give him the glory and praise he deserves. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. If I just read the message we've got it Um, now we look inside and what we see is that anyone that's anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start is created new the old life is gone and a new life emerges just look at it all of this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other It comes back to that duty, doesn't it, again? That it's about, yes, us acknowledging, receiving, and loving. But what God wants us to do is then seek out our brothers and sisters and love them too, however hard that may be sometimes. Because if there's one opportunity, dare I say, that we miss, it could be a lost soul for heaven. I know that's challenged me over the last years, but specifically over the last weeks and months when I realised the gravity of what Christ did for me and yet, dare I say, the simplicity of what I need to do in exchange and the opportunity that others may have. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah. It goes on to say, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. And he's given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We have become Christ's representatives. So, new beginnings. We've talked about school. We've talked perhaps about a new job. I've just, I was going to say gone into slightly early retirement, but it's not full. Um, I've gone down to three days a week. Not because I want to be lazy, but because I want to look at other purposes but I'm conscious that the danger is I could sit at home and perhaps just watch Homes Under the Hammer and that wouldn't be good use of my time 
And that's been a challenge, is knowing what I'm going to do with that time. But also it's about recognising that we have opportunity for new starts or for different ventures. But actually that needs to be prayed into that journey involving Christ, making sure he's the centre. We just had a, a couple that have recently got married at, uh, at church. And the importance of putting Christ at the centre of that to seek where his will is for us. Football, a new premier season. Did I, did I mention that Forest beat Liverpool yesterday? Um, but the opportunities, and perhaps it's holidays, perhaps it's planning for our next year of where we might want to go to. Perhaps it's a school start, or I've put in the centre there. Perhaps it's about church. What does that mean for SBC here? What does it mean for the building? What does it mean for you as the congregation, the church, being God's people? We need to put God at the centre, knowing that in him we are free, knowing that actually he has purpose and he has designed us individually. And there's no mistake why he's put you people together. So that should be the focus of our prayer. It's okay to challenge or ask God what his purpose is. And I think then you start to see those answers revealed if we seek God and keep him at the center. So today I want to encourage you to open yourselves more to God. Perhaps that's not just about reading the word for today or spending an odd five minutes in prayer. Perhaps it's not even about spending a few hours in prayer each day. It might be just about doing something different. But it's about knowing that we work all the time for God. So it's keeping him at the centre. And I think it is important that we hold the future of church in our hands, in our offering to prayer to God, to say, God, this is actually, it's not about us here, this is about you. This is about recognising what God wants to do, not just in this building, but in this place of Southwell and beyond. How far-reaching can SBC be? Is it just a case of hearing an odd hymn in the park? Or is it about actually going out there and actually not putting our own parameters and restraining God, but allowing God to work and let's just see what he could do? He is an awesome God and deserves our praise. But he needs to be sovereign in our lives. Every aspect. We need God we need more of God. But we need to learn to rely on him. So that when those waves come, dare I say we can almost thank him, such that we have him to rely on, that when the wave crashes, that we fall against him. We need to develop that relationship with him, to root ourselves in his word, knowing that that is truth and it's our roadmap. If ever you're worried or questioning where we need to go, look at his word. We might not like it, but it will tell us. And we need to acknowledge and learn to live, therefore, with the Holy Spirit living within us. Because that's where I believe we can start to see the real God in all his fullness. When he shows us his presence, when we acknowledge him in the midst and in here as well as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And yes, in a few moments we're going to take communion together. So perhaps today as we've got the opportunity, we may need to bring things before God to perhaps challenge us to open those to God, to actually acknowledge that we need more of him in our lives for those things an opportunity for a new start. Perhaps it's about asking him to be the focus of our gaze again, where we've taken our eye off and we've become dependent on certain things or reliant um, upon the, um, the feelings or the words of others to give us um, that sentiment of, of feeling important or valued. There's only one truth we need to hear, and that's the truth of God. 
And his word tells us that we are valued, that we are important, that we are designed as individuals. There's no one else like you. And there's a reason for that, because you are special. And that's how much God loves you. But he wants to bring you together as well, as a body, to support each other, to know each other, to work together for his goodness and his praise. So yes, God wants to know you because he loves you, no matter what has gone before, knowing that he laid everything down for you, that ultimate sacrifice, that's how much he loves you. And he wants you to experience the joy of knowing him. He wants you to know, I believe, the peace in life's storms and the overwhelming love that abounds through him. So this isn't just a Sunday in September. It's not just an everyday Sunday. This is an opportunity, I believe, for a new start. It might be just a tweak, but it could be a whole reversal, coming back to God, just asking him for more of his presence, for his peace in a tricky situation. But in that, I think it's important we acknowledge that he is sovereign and that it's all about him. So be encouraged this morning, church. I want you to feel um, encouraged that we are in Christ together, that we have him at the centre, but he is around us to protect and guide us. And I think the future is safe with him. Bless you.